Okay, we are live. Uh, so for those listening at home, welcome to the Dungeon Musings YouTube channel. My name is Kevin Madison, and I will be your friendly Dungeon Muser this evening. Uh, tonight, I'm going to take a look at the um, Barrel Maze Complete product uh, created by Greg Gillespie. Um, this is a um, Mega Dungeon setting uh, that was uh, the first of the Mega Dungeons that uh, Greg uh, Gillespie made. Um, he's made uh, two subsequent ones, um, that uh, one of which I, I own and uh, one of which was just kickstarted recently. Um, what I'm going to offer uh, today is uh, a bit of an overview of what's in the product, uh, give you a sense of what, um, um, you know, who this might be appropriate for, and, uh, you know, and get to take a look through the book and see what's, uh, what's actually in the product. Um, I have been uh, playing, or rather running, uh, Barrow Maze for my players using the Pathfinder 2nd Edition playtest at first, and then switching to a modified version of Scarlet Heroes, which is a, an OSR game that's based on the uh, D&D, uh, the basic D&D or Labyrinth Lord chassis. Uh, and the edition that I'm going to be reviewing here or talking about is the uh, version that is for Labyrinth Lord, which was a, um, an OSR old school role-playing uh, game that's based uh, heavily on the BX version of D&D. Um, but this is also available in 5th edition uh, D&D as well. Uh, I have that in PDF, but I, I don't have it in print. Uh, so I can't speak to the specifics of the um, uh, the content of that one. Um, but uh, that is available if 5th edition is more your um, uh, flavor of game and you don't want to you know do any conversions yourself if you want those stats there. Um, the, uh, the other thing I should say at the outset as well is that just by nature of this product, as I go through this, there are going to be some spoilers. So if you intend to play in Barrow Maze, um, what I'm going to do is at a certain point in the review, I will let you know that we're going into spoiler territory. That includes some of the content that's in the uh, book itself. Uh, and then, of course, the map as well. I mean, the map really I'm not super concerned with, but there's some uh, some pretty cool handouts that are really lovely to surprise players with. So I will let you know when you need to, to drop out uh, of this uh, review if you do intend to play it. Um, but you can learn a bit about the, uh, the first part of the review will be dealing with more things that, that aren't really, you know, there's no spoilers involved. So, uh, let's jump into, uh, the review. What I'm going to do, uh, well, let's maybe I, I can start off with just a, a bit of background about this. So this game, uh, or this, uh, mega dungeon, as I understand it, uh, was created as, um, uh, over the course of some actual play with uh, that Greg had with his uh, his his home group, and then it was published in a series of different smaller versions that were expanding out this this mega dungeon. But one of the things that he uh, em embraced, I guess, uh, as a uh, design concept to start with, was to um, to try and create a different kind of dungeon, something that would be uh, explored in a different way. And specifically what I mean by that is one that was spread out rather than down. So something that, uh, felt a little more organic in terms of it did have a difficulty grade to it, just like you would in other old school dungeons where you were going further down and then dungeon, it would be more dangerous in this one. Instead, it was just a, it was spread out. Um, the, um, the other thing was, was there's a, it was, it was set up to really try and, provide um over the course of the different products that were published it was designed to provide the dm as as much of as a uh, of a get up and go kind of product uh as as possible you know in comparison to other older version uh older mega dungeons you know uh, like um the uh, ruins of undermountain or something like that where there was a great deal of work that the dm still had to do or you had to read things really carefully beforehand in order to prepare yourself for it this was designed to be something that you could run you know read as you're going through the dungeon you could you know flip to the page uh, for the room that corresponds to where your players were and then just go from there there's also uh, a ton of really great resources for randomly generating uh, elements in the dungeon um, there's great um, some great uh, material that he introduced to give the dungeon more of a responsive and lived in kind of feel. And by that, I mean things like, um, you know, there are walls that are walled up at certain points, you know, as an example, where when you break them down, you will be making a bunch of noise and it triggers a, a potential random encounter. You know, it may draw some hungry pack of ghouls or, you know, zombies or something like that, or dire rats that are going to come racing, you know, over and, and try and, uh, 
mess around with your, your player characters. Um, in addition, there are some great restock rules. So as you go through the dungeon, uh, things can restock it. But uh, the version that, that uh, I have here, this uh, Barrel Maze Complete, is kind of the final word on that on that dungeon that came out in a series of smaller products beforehand. Uh, I've included a link in the description as well where you can get this. Uh, the product itself is available either as a print-on-demand uh, book or as a PDF or as a combination of the two. Um, it's this is The version I've got is the version, the print-on-demand from uh, Drive Through RPG, and it's awesome. Uh, terrific binding in it, great... Uh, uh, great, great, you know, paper quality. Uh, I have used this extensively for about six months now uh, in running the uh, Barrow Mace campaign for my players, and uh, it's held up extremely well. And it's a, it's just a great book. Like it's a, it's a really, really uh, fun thing to read through. So, what this version of it does is it provides you kind of like three different areas that sort of make up the overall campaign. Most of the campaign is going to deal with and centered around the exploration of this mega dungeon, but there the sort of zones are tiered into you know the um, uh, the town from which you'll be setting forth uh, your your adventures, uh, the Barrow Moor, the the swampy areas that surround where the uh, the maze is actually located. Uh, the barrows uh, themselves, the barrow mounds, where there's all these crypts and stuff like that. Uh, located somewhere inside the moor, and then the actual maze itself. Um, so let's back up and talk about where this is. So what, what this book gives you is a region called the Duchy of Eric. And what the Duchy of Eric is, is just, you know, it it can, it's sort of loosely set in this region called the Northern Reaches, but you could drop it into pretty much any campaign world that you, you have. And um, the... Uh, Duchy of Eric includes a number of different um, communities, which include uh, Helix, which is the town from which your characters will be setting forth to go into adventures. Uh, there is a uh, the capital, which is uh, Iron Guard Mott, and uh, there is a kind of a sinister local town also called Bog Town. And um, the expeditions, like the, the, what's in the book is a, you know a little bit of information about Iron Guard Mott, a little bit of information about uh, Bogtown, and then just a ton of great information about Helix. So um, Helix itself is given a great deal of, of, of detail, but not so much that you find yourself forgetting who people are. You know, there are, the town itself has a clear things that adventurers would need. You know, there's a person who can exchange uh, goods uh, whose name is HHR Huff and Puff, you know, it's a, which is kind of, a, I, honestly, when I first read it, I like, ugh, this is a silly name, but it's really easy for the players to remember. And um, yeah, so that's, so the, it, it's, it's, uh, there's a number of things in it where there are puns or kind of like references to pop culture in it that I would have thought, you know, if uh, I would want to have a maybe, oh, I want more, a more serious tone to it. Um, but I actually think they're a clever way of, of having players remember these NPCs uh, names because all of my players know who these different people are. And, you know, six months into the campaign now, they all know who everyone is. They know who runs the local bar. It's a guy named Balo. They know uh, one of the barmaids there, Tacy, uh, who they've gotten to know. Um, they know the local elf, a guy named Valeron uh, and, and so forth. Like it, it just, these, they give um, really simple um, but you know, the, the key necessary, uh, elements to make up for a memorable NPC, uh, for, for the role that they'll play while your characters are in town. Um, you know, there's a, uh, a local tavern called the brazen strumpet, um, where there's actually a chart where you can randomly roll and see who's in there at any given time. So if the player char player characters want to interact with other adventure groups or other people from town or, or whatever, you know, there's a go-to chart that also serves as a really helpful reminder for the DM of who the different people are in town as you're getting to know them. You know, now I'm fairly familiar with most of the different uh, uh, kind of people in town, like uh, Osun's uh, uh, Mercenary Guild is a place where your characters are going to hire hirelings, you know, and there's a great uh, online hireling generator that you can access as well as free. And it creates a little, you know, um, kind of little versions of, of our little uh, stats, I guess, for, for hirelings with a little bit of uh, flavor with each of them too, like what they did before, what they're carrying with them, what they're, you know, something that's special about their personality. 
So oh, there's a mercenary guild there. There's a trading um, or a place that'll exchange um, treasure for for coin. Uh, there's a um, an inn. Uh, there's a brothel uh, called the uh, Foul Pheasant uh, that uh, the player characters can get involved with. My one of my player characters or players, his character has particularly taken an interest in the Foul Pheasant and has got to know the proprietress of um, that particular establishment quite well. Someone named Perny Ticklebottom. Um, and, uh, let's see what else is in there. There's also a, um, trade goods, Turgan's trade goods is a, a trade goods store in there. And, uh, there's a, uh, local Smith named a uh, card barrel gut who, uh, in our particular campaign has become kind of the like local norm. You know, he's always constantly in the, in the bar and constantly makes kind of, you know, uh, well, it's not stuff that's in there, but, uh, in the actual book necessarily, but it's stuff that in the course of play that that character really has a, a clear personality and, and the book offers a really easy way to sort of spring from there and, uh, and, you know, come up with your own interpretation of who that character is. So Helix is really heavily detailed in the, in the book, but not to an, um, uh, a degree that requires you to do a lot of reading, you know, like each NPC has about two paragraphs about them. Uh, and that's enough, you know, for you to sort of go on and, and uh, see how they interact with the PCs. You don't need, feel the need to read reams of, of backstory about these NPCs. Um, if, and, you know, if your campaign does not necessarily spend a lot of time in Helix, you're not really going to need to to worry about that all that much, but it gives you the necessary outline to make that place feel like an actual community, to feel like a place that the players are actually living in. Um, the... Uh, Helix itself is probably where your characters are always going to end up. The campaign is is set up in such a way that basically the player characters can take a day trip out to the uh, Barrowmore, do some adventuring and exploring, and then make it back uh, at, in uh, you know before the sun goes down. Um, the Barrowmore uh, itself, and the, the Barrowmore, I should say, and the Barrow Maze are pretty fucking dangerous. <laughs> you know, like for especially for low level characters, they're extraordinarily dangerous, and they need to be very careful with how they go about these, um, you know, these expeditions. Um, so maybe not what I'll do now is I'm going to switch to the actual book itself and I'll start showing you some of the stuff that's, uh, that's in the book, uh, to sort of frame the rest of this conversation here. Let's see. Um, there we go. Sharing screens. Uh, so oh, let me see here. Send everyone. And there we go. Okay. So, this is the cover to uh, Barrow Maze Complete, uh, which was, I believe, done by uh, Errol Otis, one of the classic D&D artists uh, for this. It's a little, I'm not, you know, I mean, I, I like it as a classic kind of uh, style. I, I have absolutely no idea what it's supposed to represent in the game. Uh, but, you know, Errol Otis' stuff is always kind of trippy. So that is uh, in keeping with the uh, flavor of the setting. Now, the art in this in general is amazing. It really has that uh, classic uh, but polished flavor to it. It doesn't, uh, so some of the old school products, I find that they've, they, um, the publishers have not necessarily hired uh, professional artists to actually do the art in them. It's, it's you know, um, not, I mean, not, not to mean that uh, they're not, um, I'm trying to be uh, generous with the description here. I, I mean, people who aren't, you know, making their full living day to day as as artists. It's generally going to be folks who are semi pros or or amateurs. This has has definitely uh, made sure to have someone who, you know, only people who are professionals working on it, which really makes this product a step above, I think, in terms of presentation. What um, uh, what some other competing products have. Like for instance, you can take a look at the art down here. This is an exemplar of the kind of amazing art that's in here. So what this gives you here is a, there's a little bit of um, introduction about what it's about. Uh, it gives you a brief history. And as you can see, the history itself only really goes like two pages here. So it's very broad. So you can choose to flesh that out if you want, uh, or you, know, um, you can just leave it uh, fairly uh, simple. Uh, this is the map that you get for the Duchy of Eric, but if you poke around online, you can find some pretty cool color versions of that. Uh, it gives you the travel time between the different destinations in the town, excuse me, in the, um, not town, in the uh, uh, in the Duchy it's, itself. And in this map here, you can see this is the Barrow Moor. And then right here is the Barrow Maze itself. So you can see from Helix up here uh, down to... Um, the uh, Barrow or, or Barrow uh, uh, Mounds, it, it's only a, a you know an eight eight mile uh, trip uh, to get there. Uh, gives you a little information about the geography, about the Barrow you know, and uh, 
one of the things that I found really uh, interesting about this is that it, it's, you know, at first glance, you look at this map and you think that, oh my God, like this is really not, there's not that much to this uh, location. You know, there's a couple forests here. There's, we know there's some elves living there. We know there's some dwarves living there, or we're told that, and there's a human um, duchy uh, that makes up this region. Uh, there's some terrific backstory and uh, um, a real feel of history to the, to the dungeon that you find as you go through it. Uh, but the setting itself, I mean, there's not a huge amount of, uh, of information there, but the interesting thing is that it really does feel like it's enough. You know, we've been playing for about six months now. Um, and my players are the type that just like, you know, role playing and, and chasing other kind of leads and stuff like that. And uh, we have spent probably about maybe a quarter of that time actually exploring the barrel, uh, either looking for the entrance to the barrel maze or actually exploring the barrel maze. Otherwise they've been doing other things, you know, interacting with uh, NPCs or searching down other things. Um, and so uh, what I mean to say by that is that even though there, it, it seems on its face that as if there's not a lot there, you'll find that the players fill in so much of that stuff and find ways to keep themselves occupied. Uh, there's some information about the religion and the faith in here, and there's a sort of implied tension between two different pantheons, an older pantheon called the Angramac and the newer pantheon called the Futurus. And there's not, a, again, like not a huge amount of information given about this, but there's enough about it. So you can choose to play that up in your campaign if you want. Um, they don't necessarily give you clear indications of, oh, here's how you would do this. And here's what so-and-so falls on. But uh, I, we, I've made a great deal of use of that. And the tension between the uh, new faiths, including uh, St. Yig, and the old faith, particularly the faith of the green man, um, ha has really become a signature part of, uh, of our campaigns. And in particular, uh, a really key part of one character's, uh, sort of, you know, journey. So here's the, uh, description of the gods. Now, if you're playing a campaign that does not, um, that has, you know, either your own world or you're plunking it into like, you know, an existing campaign world, like Greyhawk or like Golarian or whatever, you can, these, uh, gods are you know, generic enough for you to be able to re-skin them to be whatever you you need them to be. Uh, when we were playing this with um, Pathfinder 2nd Edition, I was able to find equivalents for each of these gods in the uh, Pathfinder Pantheon. Uh, this is now next a little information about the different towns, or a little more information about the towns and settlements. So there's Bog Town. Uh, there is Iron Guard Mott with the crest for the Iron Guard uh, family. And then of course, Helix. So here's the map of Helix that's in the, in the book. And uh, this is what we've been using in our campaign as the, as the descriptor, you know, or as the, the way of understanding what's there, what you've got in town, you know, you can see right here at eight uh, is the um, brazen strumpet. And then tucked behind that, there's the, the old um, uh, foul pheasant. Uh, this is the shrine of St. Yig over here. In the middle of town uh, at uh, five is uh, the, no, this is a name I always forget because it's got a really long name, Standards, uh, Silver Standard Mer uh, Merchant Caravan Company. That's the people who will be hiring you to go in and out. Number four is um, Ocean's Mercenary Guild. Number three is uh, Barrel, uh, Kirk, uh, Kirk Barrel Guts. Um, it's the Axe and Anvil. Um, and then there's some other you know places in town. There's an old wizard's tower over here. Uh, and then there's some places, uh, some things outside of town beyond just the barrel maze itself or the barrel moors, I should say, that can keep your characters occupied. But as I can say, as you say, there's, there's really only about a paragraph or two about each of the different locations, uh, but more than enough to sort of fill your, you know, fill your imagination. And then there are these great little illustrations at the top of these pages here that show what, you know, a take on these characters could be. So you've got Balo here, you got Tacey, uh, Alistair, who is this kind of um, mentally um, injured uh, guy who's suffering from some kind of mental trauma after being found abandoned as the sole survivor, I guess, not abandoned, but the sole survivor from a, a, an aborted Barrow Maze expedition. Um, uh, Gamdar is a character who he's a half orc, who is a priest of, or a uh, acolyte, I should say, of uh, the church of St. Yeg. Othar is uh, the one who runs the shrine. And our uh, Gamdar has really played kind of a, He's a minor villain in our campaign, but, um, you know, it's, it's 
like a lot of uh, sandbox campaigns, the stuff is presented and it's it's how the players react to it is how they choose to, you know, uh, what becomes important. My, like, for instance, my, my players really latched onto Valoran, the, the elf that's here, because they really wanted to make friends with the elves of the uh, Thorns Wild Forest. And, um, and that, so we just ran with it. I mean, that, that character became a, a fairly prominent part of the game. Um, they briefly dealt with uh, Krothos uh, Iron Guard, who's kind of like the uh, jackass son of the uh, local, but uh, they didn't really spend a lot of, they didn't seem to, to click with him all that much. So he hasn't played a, an awful lot of uh, importance in the, uh, in the campaign. Um, and as I said, there's only about a paragraph or two in each of these people, but, uh, and then, the secrets about them are in um, bold here. So if there are secrets that uh, each of these, or some of the, the characters in uh, the non-player characters in town have, you can, uh, you, you know, it's easy for the, for the DM to, to see that and remember that, oh yeah, shit, there's, you know, when they're interacting with this person, I need to bear in mind that they're, they've got X, you know, external factor. There are, uh, or X kind of like motivation or secret or whatever, and then just play that accordingly. And then that may or may not uh, become important in the course of the campaign. Uh, Brother Othar has become a really significant NPC in our campaign as well, too, as one character really took to him. He just really like liked that guy an awful lot. So he's become a, a fairly um, important presence in the game. Uh, there are some ideas for how to, kick things off for, for your, your uh, characters, you know, why to get them to the, why they might be interested in going to the barrow maze for myself. What I, I just told the players, look, this campaign is about exploring the barrow maze. So the only thing you need to do is come here with a reason for why this particular character is going to want to keep going into that maze. That's the only thing I need. Like rather than having to come up with reasons myself, uh, you know, to try and keep the characters motivated, I put it on the players and, and that's worked out great. You know, like the, this whole campaign, the players have, uh, have been driving the um, uh, things forward, you know, regularly going back out and trying to find that entrance to the barrow maze. Uh, there's a list of different rumors that you can start with, some of which are true, some of which are false. And this is a great way of just starting the game with some um, some sort of atmosphere, I guess, for the for the barrow maze. You know, what uh, um, with the players, uh, you know, their characters, I guess, knowing some stuff about it, and uh, that helps create the sort of I don't know, like mythic and really larger than life presence that the Barrow Maze should have in this campaign. You know, there's a lot of great tools in this for making the, the maze feel present and, and um, feel like a threat constantly uh, in the sense of like the amount of necromantic power it emits, the walking dead that's around there, the centuries and centuries of history behind the thing that you slowly over the course of the campaign can can dole out to the players, you know, even little things like uh, uh, some of the magic items and stuff like that, or the um, things that you find in the tombs There's some great uh, uh, random tables for generating, you know, what's in the, the actually, well, actually, one of the things as an example is there are these, um, crests that you can uh, get, you know, are they called crests? Hold on. I actually don't remember. Um, where are they here? They're not runic tablets, not death masks. Oh yeah. The scarabs. So the scarabs are, um, when it was it them, um, 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 um. oh, sorry. It's these little nest rock, which are like, uh, um, wait, that's not what I'm thinking of either. I mean, it was a scarab. Anyway, there, there's, um, scarabs that, uh, I've just reskinned as being like little, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, crests. And, uh, some of them have, you know, um, have, have beneficial abilities and stuff like that, but some of them are cursed. And the way that the, the game plays up, that is it sort of, it, it makes, uh, you know, consistently you're finding the same evidence of the same culture as you're going through the different, uh, barrel mounds or as you're going through the barrel maze itself, which really plays up the atmosphere of the, um, you know, of the setting. And it's very, very easy for a DM to just improv stuff, to add more, uh, more flavor or more, you know, um, more story, I guess, to the, to the, uh, things they find, you know, and, uh, like a, a good example of this is one of my players found a cursed, um, amulet on him. And it was a, it, 
I think it slowed him. I think that's that's what the the curse was, and he just wouldn't take it off. And I told him like, well, you just need to, you know, your character won't take this off. He refuses to give it to anyone else, and blah blah blah. And because these things are fairly commonly found in the Barrow Maze, I, you know, we just slipped in th when they were trying to get some uh, or sell this thing to HHR Huff and Puff, the guy who you know will buy your treasure for a, a specific um, discount or a certain uh, fee. Um, I was able to use him to fill in the fact that like, look, there's been lots of these cursed things found there and you know, yeah, you can take it away from uh, him. Uh, but when we did this before, we found that he murdered his colleagues trying to get the thing back and they found him outside of HHR Hoffenpuff's um, Emporium trying to break in and, and recover the, the scarab. And that became, you know, for about uh, a month and a bit, uh, it became a regular presence. And one of the impacts that that's going to have on the campaign going forward is they will be so careful when they find these things, even though, you know, in the book, the rules as written, some of these things are quite beneficial. They're still going to be doubly careful, you know, with everything they do in the, um, yeah, yeah, when they're finding loot. And I love that. Like I, it makes them react and, uh, and makes, makes them react to the setting and the fictional stuff in a credible and believable way. And it regularly makes it a presence. Every time they open up a crypt and they find something in there from now on, that one player at least is going to be thinking, Oh shit, we got to be careful. We can't just jump in there and grab stuff. Like what, what horrible thing might wait, uh, you know, await me in there. So anyway, um, the next thing here is, uh, running the barrel maze. There's a great de uh, descriptions of the things that you want to keep track of, like sound in the barrel maze, both the barrel moor and the barrel maze themselves are silent. They're extremely quiet. And that atmosphere is something you can really play up. You know, they, they, uh, I keep saying they, but it's you know, Greg, uh, constantly says that this, uh, you know, and reminds you that this place is as still and as dark as a tomb. You know, so every time your characters do anything, talking too loud, casting spells, smashing down, you know, bricked up walls or things like that, um, it's things that really create a disturbance in there and that might draw monsters, you know, and uh, my players have learned to fear that clatter of dice when I roll a random encounter and they give some great random encounters in here as well. And that just, um, that just makes for a really fun and uh, tense, you know, uh, dungeon delving experience. Uh, and I mentioned as well, too, there is the dungeon restock uh, that happens as well. Uh, when players come out, you roll again and see whether things might, uh, you know, might have wandered in and taken up residence in a, a new part of the, uh, of the room or new part of the dungeon that they've already been to. And uh, that I've actually used that for some of the barrel mounds when they were first exploring some of the barrel mounds as well. And it just gave the setting a really terrific, um, you know, verisimilitude. It gave it a, a real s a f sense and uh, and feeling of a believable and reactive world that was bigger than just what was happening in the character's story. And that's awesome. Like, that's, that's exactly, I think, one of the things that uh, attracts people to running and playing um, sandbox campaigns. So uh, managing time is a big thing in this as well, too, because... You know, uh, searching the time that it takes to search through, you know, uh, burial crypts. Uh, you know, if there's each and there's many, many of these walls where they're going to have rows of barrow, you know, of uh, crypts basically in the side. You know, if you can think of the way I've been describing it, because that's the way it's been described in the in the book, is if you think of the third Indiana Jones movie when they go underneath that uh, ch uh, church that became a library and they're making their way through those tunnels and there's all those burial crypts in the walls. That's what tons of the barrel maze and the barrel mounds themselves are like. So it takes a long time to go through all those little alcoves, it takes time to smash down brick walls to, you know, br to uncover like some of these barrel mounds before they actually, the characters actually find an entrance to the barrel maze itself. They need to, you know, sometimes be wandering around the barrel mounds, trying to avoid or deal with the horrible things that are lurking there. Uh, and then sometimes they're having to actually dig up you know, the entrance to these barrel mounds smash their way in because some of them are blocked by giant stones. And um, that, again, just, it makes it feel, I think, like a, I don't know, like, there, like there's more purpose and there's more actual exploration that's going on. It, it feels very much like a, a more, more of like an archaeological expedition 
Uh, and then just, you know, going to a gamey kind of like, this is the dungeon we're going to go in here and everyone knows where the entrance is. So I love that. I really, uh, I really love that. The characters have now found an entrance to the Barrow Maze, so that's cool. But that time that they spent when they're wandering around the, uh, the mounds trying to find that entrance was, was really, really cool. And I look forward to doing that again when I run this campaign a second time. Um, then there's a little more information about uh, some of the specific things you'll find in there, like death masks and funerary figures and scarabs and canoptic jars. And uh, then there is some information about the factions. So like a lot of mega dungeons, this particular campaign has different groups that are present in the, in the barrel maze itself that all have different goals. And some of those uh, will actually have enough power to extend beyond the reach of the barrel maze itself. So uh, this gives you a, a rough idea of what, without having to read through the whole dungeon, it tells you who's sort of the power players and whatnot in there. And um, and then also how you know how you end this campaign. So that's 27 pages that basically gives you everything you need to know about running this particular game. You don't need to read anything further than that. And even that of, of that section, there are several areas where there are, um, you know, uh, it's random tables and stuff like that that will only come up when uh, the characters find stuff like that in the uh, games. Then we go to <clears throat> the next uh, section is, is divided to the, um, or uh, talks about the Barrow Mounds. And uh, I'm not going to go through this in uh, a huge amount of detail because there's a ton of different uh, mounds, but this is the map. Let me uh, rotate this sucker. Hold on here, rotate clockwise. There we go. So that's the map. Um, and what this tells you is where, you know, the different mounds are. And each of these, the numbers that you see here it corresponds to a different entry in the book. And um, yeah, some of these things actually contain uh, entrances to the um, uh, to the actual barrow maze. Now, the, um, there's other things that, that contain a bunch of other cool stuff. I'm going to finish rotating this. Um, but, uh, while the players are wandering around, you can also find there are some random encounters because every, uh, 20 minutes, so every two turns of play, you will be making a random encounter roll. And if you roll, I believe it's a five or a six, uh, maybe it's a, it's either a six or a five or a six, uh, you, the players have uh, an encounter and you roll and see what it is. If it's a daytime encounter, it's probably not going to be you know, out of their, or at least not terribly far out of their abilities, because you do key it to their level. You know, there's a low level random encounter table. There's a mid-level random encounter table for the mounds. But if you do it at night, at night, it's going to be a lot more dangerous. Like if you take a look here, you can see that a result of one during the day is 1d6 skeletons while there's double that at night. Same thing for zombies. And then there's some other awful things like coffer corpses, which are kind of like zombies that will just strangle you and keep strangling you until you are dead. Uh, and then uh, ghasts, like ghasts are a really, really powerful threat for uh, low level characters. So uh, the, this gives you a really handy way to emphasize to players that they do not want to be, you know, farting around the barrel mounds at night. Um, <clears throat> I will just click through a little bit here just to show you some of the art in it because uh, I, I just love this stuff. Uh, I, there are, um, one of the things that, uh, I, I think I mentioned that, uh, some of the mounds have is these big stone doors and players need to spend, or player characters need to spend time smashing through those things. They need to bring out sledgehammers, which, you know, take up, uh, part of your encumbrance because encumbrance is, is a, a big thing in uh, old school play. And, um, or, you know, what they need to do is hire hirelings because the more people you have working on these things, the faster you get in. And the reason that's important is because when you're making that much noise outside trying to smash through these things, again, the barrel mound, the barrel maze, and the barrel moors are silent. So that noise is carried off into the misty kind of surroundings and brings horrible things to, to uh, come and find out what is making all that damn noise. So... Um, then we go through here. There's a bunch of uh, mounds, and there are a ton of them to explore. And look at that art. Man, that's cool. And that goes on for about, I think it's about 30 or 40 pages here. There's another great one. Uh, I think that's Tim Truman, actually. Yeah, a uh, picture of a death knight. And then when you get to um, the one entrance, you can get yourself into the actual 
barrel maze. Now I'm going to be getting into some um, spoiler territory now. So if, if you do intend to play the barrel maze, I'd stop watching the review at this point and just, you know, beg your uh, DM to uh, to run this for you because it's a great, great uh, campaign. If you're a DM though, uh, let's keep going. So this is uh, one of the entrance and probably the first entrance that the characters will get and they'll access one of sort of the first area of the uh, barrel maze. And then this is the next, um, actually the next big chunk, which is most of the book is divided into, I think it's three different areas here. Oh, four, five, at which are the, as you make your way through six, uh, through the uh, barrel maze, it becomes progressively there's seven and do, 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 do eight. And nine, ten, ten different areas, which is amazing. And as you go through these, it becomes progressively harder. And each of the different, uh, well, I guess one thing I'll say is that there is an encounter very early on in the barrel maze. And again, I, I won't spoil it just in case there's anyone listening, but it is one of the, it's one of my favorite like trap encounters I've ever read. I'm to be honest, I'm not usually one to make use of traps all that much in, uh, in game. Um, just cause I, I don't run a lot of dungeons. Uh, you know, I tend to get very bored of them and, uh, my players tend to, if I'm bored, then I kind of, you know, it's hard to maintain, um, maintain the player's interest as well too. But this is, is such a great first trap because it completely sets the tone for the rest of the dungeon. It sets the player's, completely on edge uh it totally um it totally totally like uh, drives home the idea that if you make a false step in here you will fucking die and uh and that's terrific like it really the players were scrambling around like maniacs uh when this thing happened and uh and it's just awesome and and that it's not that every single you know, room is some awful, horrible trick that's just going to kill your characters. Um, the dungeon does seem to play fair, like by its own, in the sense of it playing it by its own rules. But for that initial encounter, it does such a great job of setting the tone or I guess reinforcing the same tone, which is to say that this place hides some kind of incredibly powerful necromantic energy that is affecting everything else around it. It's so powerful that it's causing corpses to raise up and wander around hungry for the flesh of the living as far away as, you know, 16 miles or 20 miles away at the town of Helix. And uh, at the end of this, here's that, that very cool picture that we've got on the screen there. That is uh, one of the major villains of the piece, uh, a um, uh, necro or a uh, necrotic dragon known as Osithrax pejorative. And uh, he has started playing a role in my campaign, but more as that kind of like rumored, you know, Sauron in the Lord of the Rings, his presence is felt in his name and his underlings. And that's just awesome. And that's how much of the, of the dungeon is, is uh, laid out as well. You know, it's, it's that these things, you feel their presence well before you ever actually see them. But, uh, but yeah, um, the actual dungeon itself is i'll show you the map when we get to the end but it is massive it is huge it's got great internal consistency uh and it's benefited from you know tons and tons and tons of actual play and revision so it's uh and i guess the best thing is is that everything every room is something that you can just quickly read in a paragraph or two you know and the book is is designed for you to be to be able to read it, get it in your head, and then describe it in your own words, rather than constantly having to be looking down and reading block text. You know, you can do it. Like it's written well enough and atmospherically enough to to use that just as your description of the different rooms and so forth. But uh, but yeah, that's it's just it's really really great for that. For it makes it very easy to run, and it's a a low stress game. It just allows you to focus on making sure that the play at the table is the best that you can make it and just uh, you know know that the product will be strong enough uh, that when you need to just go back to it and refer to it it's going to be it's going to have all the information that you would need for whatever part of the dungeon that your characters now find themselves in here's a bunch of new magic items which are of course written for 
you know, use with Labyrinth Lord, but this can be used with any OSR game. I, I saw uh, today someone was posting on the Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea uh, MIUI page that uh, they've been using that game uh, to, to run this. But you can run it with, uh, when I purchased this, my int original intention was actually to run it with uh, the uh, Adventure Conqueror King game, um, which is my, my one of my favorite um, OSR games, but uh, you, you can use it for anything. You can use it for original D&D, you could use it for um, Swords and Wizardry, you could use it for um, AD&D, you know, what, any of those old school games. Castles and Crusades might need a little bit of uh, work on your part, uh, but, um, you know, and to be honest with, you know, some, uh, some work on your part, you can easily use this with any other version of D and D as well, too. You know, I use, as I said, I use this with Pathfinder second edition, uh, the play test version. And, uh, we really, really, really enjoyed it. Like the first three months of play was with that, uh, that rule set. And, uh, we made the change because we didn't ultimately feel that, that particular game set system supported the style of play that we were trying to achieve with the game. To us, it was more important to be making progress through the dungeon and so forth uh, than just, um, you know, um, making, you know, playing it with that game. But uh, I found it very easy to, to convert stuff over. So if you happen to play uh, fifth edition or Pathfinder original first edition or Pathfinder second edition, or, you know, um, I don't know what other games you might, uh, uh, whether, uh, more ver modern versions you might play with, but, uh, you, you could easily convert this over fourth edition. You'd have a, a great deal of trouble with, but, uh, but otherwise, you know, the book as written gives you enough stuff to, um, to draw from, to convert. But, uh, anyway, uh, here's a bunch of new spells as well, again, for labyrinth Lord. And then it gets into the monsters. Now there are some monsters that are included in the, um, in the actual dungeon and in the random encounter tables that you do need to refer to the Labyrinth Lord uh, books for. So either the Labyrinth Lord um, core book uh, or the advanced edition companion, or at the time of recording, uh, there was just released advanced Labyrinth Lord, which is a combination of those two things into one product. You can actually get those for free. There are art free versions of both of those books. So conceivably you could run this mega dungeon with just that with just the mega dungeon if you have the pdf of the mega dungeon and uh for art free copies of those other two books you're good to go you know and there is months and months and months of gameplay uh, available for you here so um there's another uh, mega dungeon uh greg gillespie second one they just had all the monsters in the in the book but for this one you do need to make reference to uh those other books and as you can see like the art in here is just awesome uh, there's a ton of really great and unique kind of monsters that are in here. You know, Barrel Whites, Barrel Mummy. Um, what are some of my favorites in here? Some of these are actually just uh, versions of monsters from e late either AD&D or later versions of D&D that aren't in the Labyrinth Lord books uh, that he's converted over. So things like uh, the Cloaker, the uh, Serapod is really just a, um, oh, what are they called? Uh, not Griff, but... Um, uh, I don't know, Grell uh, from the Fiend Folio. Um, what else we got in here? Death Knights, again, uh, something from uh, Fiend Folio. Maybe that's where all the stuff is from, actually, is Fiend Folio or uh, Froglings, I think, are just Griply reskinned, which is from Monster Manual 2. Uh, Magog is the, uh, yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the stuff seems to be just based on Labyrinth Lord versions of either unique monsters for the setting or things that came from um, later books in AD&D. Uh, either the Fiend Folio or uh, Monster uh, Manual 2. Um, let's see here. What else we got? Um, Skeletal Warrior, Spectral Dead. So, oh, Tomb Robbers. Awesome. Love them. And here's some unfortunate uh, heroes falling victim to the ghouls that uh, inhabit the, um, <laughs> the Barrow Maze. Uh, then you got some pre-generated characters if you don't want to generate your own characters. But, you know, for... Labyrinth Lord takes very little time to, to create. These characters are for the Advanced Edition Companion. Uh, so the, the, if you're not familiar with Labyrinth Lord, the Advanced Edition Companion basically makes the same uh, distinction between, or makes a separation between race and class uh, the same way that AD&D does and that basically every other later version of D&D does that uh, Basic did not. Uh, Labyrinth Lord did not make uh, your race for 
elves, dwarves, halflings are a class. This is using the rules for the advanced edition companion. Um, <clears throat> but probably, I can't imagine it'd be that much difficulty just using these as, uh, you know, with uh, the basic, if you were, if that's your flavor of, um, of D&D. And then there are some rival adventuring parties in here. Uh, I've only made uh, a sporadic use of this stuff just because my players have, have um, kept themselves occupied with other things. But there's a great bit of, you know, backstory with each of these things. Not, not a huge amount that you need to, you know, get out a spreadsheet for it, but uh, enough to make some of them feel really unique. Like I, I have had one of these lurking around my player characters. So they're going to play a role, I'm, I'm sure, at some point, but uh, just not yet. Uh, then you got a Barrow Mace specific uh, character sheet for uh, Labyrinth Lord, which looks awesome. And uh, then this is one of the things that I, I wanted to make sure players were not seeing. So if you are a player who has continued watching this review, uh, and you will be watching or will be playing through uh, Barrow Maze at some point, we're going to now take a look at the illustration book. And this will genuinely ruin some content for you. So if you are going to be a player in the Barrow Maze campaign and you have soldiered on trying to, you know, just to see some other some other information about this, I'm going to encourage you to drop out of this uh, review right now because you're going to, some of this stuff that's in here, these are all illustrations that are designed to be handed out to players to show parts of the Mar uh, Barrow Maze. This stuff is really, really well done. And I think that uh, you will be doing, I mean, you're just... Um, affecting your enjoyment of the content if you uh, if you do stick through with this. So that's well, a, a final opportunity for you to drop out of, um, of the review here. Uh, I'm assuming now that all players who don't want to have anything spoiled have left, and it's just us DMs around. So let's take a look at some of this awesome stuff. So first we got, boom, we got the uh, Barrow Maze entrance. So this is what players see when they first see the Barrow Maze that door to the barrow maze lying on the ground. This is the first entrance they're likely to come across. Then as they start making their way through, this is the, uh, on the left there, that is the block and tackle that they will see leading down into the hole, the first room that they're likely to encounter in the barrow maze. Um, where is it here? This awesome illustration is the first hallway that they are likely to see as they get into the barrow maze. And, um, yeah, that's just awesome. Um, all the illustrations in this are, uh, are black and white. Um, but, uh, I, I don't feel that they really affect the quality, you know, of, uh, of this. I actually like some of these a lot better than uh, similar, Ill, uh, paintings that I thought were felt kind of rushed or just not, you know, not as, as, um, as well done, uh, that I found in like fourth edition D and D products or, uh, or even some uh, fifth edition stuff. So uh, this is just an example of some of the amazing stuff that you find in here. That is a great little asset to hand out to your players to make the barrow maze feel more real. And also, you know, to play into those old, like the old uh, Tomb of Horrors had something similar where there were these great illustrations you could hand out to your players to really play up. So not only is this a cool uh, extra part of this product, it's a great kind of callback to the history of uh, mega dungeons or or D D dungeons themselves, but uh, anyway, and then the last thing or one of the last things here is the start of the map. So I'm just going to go through this slowly, so you can get a sense of just how much content there is here. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six pages of dungeon. Let's just take a look through here. The numbering in these dungeon rooms goes up to uh, just into the 300s. 375, I believe, is the final room. So that's just how much amazing content the players can go through. And because of the restock rules, there is plenty of, of even without doing any work yourself, there is easy mechanics for making this place constantly feel alive i guess not technically alive it'd be undead but making it feel like a living uh area you know and without having to put a great deal of work with no creative input and just some dice rolls you can keep this place feeling fresh every time the players go back to it and also potentially with new stuff for them to loot and recover so uh so that's awesome these are the rules or some um Encounter tables for the Barrowmoor. Now, the only thing I would, uh, the only criticism I would have of the layout in this 
is this particular um, table because I always have a hell of a time trying to find this. I don't know why this wasn't put with the section on the barrel more and then move the stuff to the barrel mounds here or even just keep them together. But it is such a minor criticism for what is otherwise an amazing product. But th these are the random encounter tables that are uh, specifically tuned for the barrow moor and again they're also keyed to levels so it keeps the things that the players encounter challenging at all times this is that chart that i mentioned that tells you you know allows you to randomly generate who is in the tavern at any given time whether they're going in a day night or whatever and you may find that like for myself i printed mine off and i just you know tick along for each different day it, it's a really clever little resource for keeping track of the npcs and and letting you know, uh, letting the place feel like it's got uh, some kind of rhythm to it or predictable thing. Like uh, Karg Barrelgut, the dwarf who runs the uh, Axe and Anvil, he is in the bar 65% of the time at night. So uh, in our campaign, for instance, he, he that, that seems to always be the case. He's always coming in there. But, uh, you know, it, it also makes the place, uh, it, it's another one of the examples of how this place can feel real because, you know, if the players are, say, looking to speak to Valeron, he's only got a 35% chance of being there at night. So more often than not, they probably won't find him there. You know, um, this is a list of uh, random dungeons, a hundred uh, options for random dungeon dressing. If you want to add a little bit of uh, extra flavor to the room, that's great. Uh, random pit encounters, random graffiti, which I love. <laughs> Uh, so for ours, uh, the first room, you're supposed to randomly generate a, um, a, a bit of uh, graffiti that that's been scrawled on the wall by some previous expedition. And for ours, I happen to roll, they are coming. And it's just like, that was so great. The look in the player's face when they, when they read that, um, it just made the place feel so much scarier than, you know, uh, it not, it just added to that, that fear that omnipresent fear of we're in a dangerous place, you know, that, uh, that the dungeon should feel like, um, runic tablet results here, random results. There's the dungeon restock, uh, chart that I mentioned, random sarcophagus, uh, contents, which is awesome. And this is something I really love too. It is a random, uh, mound. Uh, sorry, a barrel mount uh, generator. You can just use this. You sit down with some dice and you roll up what, uh, you know, your random um, uh, barrel mace or barrel mounts, uh, your mount is going to look like. So like I actually used that for several of the sessions that I ran and it was tons of fun. Like just to get the players familiar uh, with the whole dungeon, you know, um, delving kind of sensibilities, like checking for traps, like, you know, um, looking for hidden doors and things like that. These are great kind of training wheels opportunities to do that, you know, and um, the random tables that you roll on here really do give you a, a, a fun, you know, um, a really fun, unpredictable kind of, you know, uh, I don't know what I'm saying here. The, it gives you, a, a, again, like a, it's not something you would necessarily ever come up with. It's a really fun and surprising result where the things that players are going through uh, are not necessarily like, you know, even if they know you quite well, they're not going to be uh, able to guess what uh, might be found because it's been randomly generated. Uh, the other cool thing about it too is that it gives you as a DM the opportunity to kind of fill in the backstory and come up with, well, why why is this the case? You know, why is this, uh, this creature in here? Why was the door unlocked at this point? You know, why did they find a bloody footprint? as the entrance in there. And that, that can lead to a lot of fun opportunities to, to generate story and, and whatnot in, uh, in the course of your campaign. Um, and what else here? More, uh, random uh, tables for like traps and, um, loot that's found in the different things. Here's your worksheet for making barrel mounds. And then the, um, artists just, so this is just the, um, the folks who worked on the product beyond, uh, uh, Mr. Gillespie himself, or Professor Gillespie, uh, technically. And then here's some uh, illustrations from the original editions of Barrel Maze. So that is uh, that. That's what's in the, um, the Barrel Maze book. Let me see here. Oh, hide. Nope, I want to do that. Stop sharing. That's what I want to do. Sorry. Uh, so that's the book. That's what's in, in the book. Um, who is this for? So 
if you are someone who is interested in running a uh, mega dungeon, but you've got no experience with it, uh, or if you just don't have time to prepare, you know, uh, if you don't have time to, to put together a complete setting, um, if you're new to D&D or uh, role playing in general, this is a great product to start with because it you do many of the standard kind of things that you're going to do in D and D, um, and, and it, you know, in a very easy and intuitive way, in and in a way that makes it uh, it's easy and friendly for a, a DM to run. However, if you're a more experienced uh, dungeon master, this is still phenomenal, fertile ground from which you can run a more involved and complicated campaign. Uh, in my particular campaign, I, I mentioned I was using a, a game system that this product was not designed for, and it worked great for that. Um, in addition, I've added in some rules for uh, different factions because I wanted the players to have an opportunity if they were interested in trying to curry favor with, say, you know, House Iron Guard or the Cult of the Green Man or the Shrine of Saint Jaeger or whatever, or the Elves of the Thorns Wild Forest. Um, to give them rules for the, for them to interact with that stuff. And uh, that was so easy to do because there was a terrific starting point from which to, to build. Um, and if it sounds like I'm giving this product an overwhelmingly uh, positive endorsement, it, it's because I can't think of anyone who wouldn't enjoy this particular product apart from someone who doesn't want to run a, a dungeon. You know, this game, this particular campaign and this product is all about exploring the mega dungeon. Um, but you know, uh, if, and if that's your, if that's not your bag, this is not the product for you. However, if you're someone who has you know, like me, I, I just, I really shied away from any dungeon exploration because I found it boring. It was tedious when I did it as a player. It was tedious when I ran it as a, a DM, but this is an amazing and fun product. We, you know, we've been playing weekly, uh, sometimes twice a week, uh, for six months now with this, and we're still all itching and dying to get back to that barrel maze and explore more and see what's going to happen next. And, um, part of the, the, the persisting, excitement and investment I have in the product is the, is the random encounter stuff and the random generation stuff and the random restock, because I'm being surprised by it. I'm seeing what's happening uh, to a degree as are the players. And that's awesome. I really love that. It's, it's a much more satisfying uh, game for me uh, than just seeing the players go through a pre-made module or as um, you know, through a, a, a story that I've uh, written for them to play through. Um, the uh, the other thing too is even if you don't use the product as design, if you're not using it to run through the mega dungeon, those random encounter tables, those random generations for the barrel mounts and stuff like that are phenomenal. And you can use them in any other campaign. I've used them in um, my um, Bar Barbarian Conquerors of Kanahu game I ran. Uh, and I'm also planning on using it in an upcoming Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerers of Hyperborea campaign because it just gives such interesting results. And you can tweak the stuff as much as you want, but having those tables to create those, um, you know, create those consistent uh, elements in, in the different mounds they're going to find, you know, if they're constantly finding canoptic jars or they're constantly finding the um, runic tablets, you know, those are things that help emphasize the the same culture, you know, it's, it's like if you're going through a bunch of Egyptian tombs, you're going to be finding canoptic jars and things like that, you know, or mummified cats, uh, little things that just, you know, without any effort on the part of the DM, just relying on the random tables helps you make another element of the world feel more real and believable to the players. And, uh, and that makes my job easier. And, uh, then I can just focus on making sure everyone is having a terrific time. So, um, so if you are looking for, uh, dungeon. If you've if you've shied away from running something like that, something like that before, um, this is a really really terrific product to check out. Even just as an exemplar too. If you never intend on running it as written, it is a terrific exemplar of of how to put together a product like this. You know how to put something together that you can run for years and years and years using just the same you know uh, the same relatively uh, short book. So. That is my review or overview of the uh, Barrel Maze Complete. Again, if it does sound like something you'd be interested in, you can uh, find a link through to Drive Through RPG where you can purchase a PDF or a PDF and print combo or just a print combo, though I think the print and the PDF and print is the same. 
So, um, so yeah, so you I mean if you you can either get it in PDF or print with a free PDF as well too. And the PDF version does actually come with separate maps too, so you can get nice big copies of the uh, of the maps uh, for for you to draw from too, which uh, I've used to create digital versions in uh, in Rule Twenty for my games, but. Uh, Anyway, um, as always, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns regarding the product, uh, or uh, if there's other things uh, you want to you want to share your own experiences, I guess with the barrel maze, because I know a lot of folks have made use of this product before uh, in the OSR movement, at least or the OSR scene. Um, please don't hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section below, uh, or you can shoot me a tweet on Twitter at Dungeon Musings. Uh, all one word and plural, or you can shoot me an email at dungeonmusings at gmail.com. Uh, or if you, um, oh, I said, that's all the ways to, to reach me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, alternatively as well, if you uh, want to find more uh, of my content, um, you can find uh, our actual campaign playing through the barrel maze on this channel. There's a, a playlist uh, that you can find. If you click through to the um, channel and then go to the playlist, you'll find our barrel maze. Uh, campaign. The first half of that again was played with uh, Pathfinder Second Edition, uh, the, the Pathfinder Second Edition playtest, uh, and then we switched over to Scarlet Heroes. But the content, the setting content, is all strictly from the book. So um, if you want to get a sense of uh, what that's like, that's uh, there for you as well. Uh, you can also find me on your favorite podcast platform at the Dungeon Musings podcast. I talk about Barrow Maze quite a bit on there in the first couple of episodes. And uh, because of the ongoing nature of our campaign, I tend to wax poetic on some of the other elements of the uh, Barrow Maze on that there as well. So um, anyway, otherwise, I hope that the end of year is treating you all well. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, thanks for watching and happy gaming.